Hello, and today we're going to talk about atomic structure, orbitals, and isotopes. So at GCSE, you were taught that the structure of an atom is something called the Bohr model. Now at A-level, we make things a bit more complex. We don't use the Bohr mo model. So as a quick reminder, the Bohr model states that you have a nucleus of an atom and electrons orbit this nucleus a bit like a planet around the sun with the, with the shells n equals 1, which n is the principal quantum number, n equals 2, n equals 3, and n equals 4. However, this will go up to a higher number. In reality, at A level, when we expand on this, you still have this inner nucleus, and you still have these outer shells, n equals 1, 2, 3, and 4. However, these are actually divided into subshells and then further divided into orbitals. And I will show you what they are. So if we start with the nucleus first, at the top you have the atomic number. And at the bottom you have the atomic mass. So this is just an example from any periodic table that you can find online or you will be given as data. So in this case of carbon, the atomic number is 6, and the atomic mass we will round to 12. It's not 12 in real life, it's 12.011, and my last slide will explain why. So, a nucleus is made up of nucleons, which are in this case protons, which are positively charged, and neutrons, which have no charge. So how do we know how many protons and how many neutrons an atom has? So if we look at the atomic number, which in this case for carbon is 6, that actually relates to the number of protons. So in this case carbon has 6 protons. If we look at this bottom number, which we've rounded to 12 in this case, we see that the atomic mass is 12. And because it's 12, the atomic mass is the sum of the neutrons and the protons. Now, that's quite easy to work out how many neutrons it has, because it's just 12 minus 6. So neutrons and protons minus the number of protons is the number of neutrons. So there's 6 neutrons. And it's as simple as that. So that, now let's move on to the electrons. So as I said earlier, you haven't got this Bohr model anymore. You have something called subshells and orbitals. So a subshell is a collection of orbitals, and an orbital is defined as a region around the nucleus that can hold up to two electrons with opposite spins. That definition is taken straight from OCR, so anyone on the OCR exam board will need to know that, and you can gain marks for that exact de definition. So, a subshell isn't actually, or sorry, an orbital isn't actually where the electron will always be. Quantum mechanics and mathematicians worked out that an electron from an atom can be anywhere at all in space. However, 99% of the time, or 90% of the time, depending what variable they put in, it will be in a set area. And they worked out this area to be, for s electrons, a sphere, and for p electrons, this three-dimensional dumbbell shape. So on one axis you have a dumbbell, which looks a bit like this, and then on the other two axes you have the exact same shape. However, each orbital, which the S subshell has one orbital, each orbital can only hold two electrons. So therefore the S subshell has a total of two electrons. However, the P subshell contains three orbitals and each one can hold two electrons, meaning there's a total of six electrons in the P subshell, which at GCSE you were taught that for shell number one, there's 
two electrons for shell number two. There are eight electrons for shell number three. There are eight electrons and for shell number four, there are two electrons. <coughs> now this explains why N only has two because it only has an S subshell. When N is two, it has eight electrons because it has an S and a P subshell. And for three and four, four here is completely wrong. They only wanted you to go up to a certain atom, which is why they let it at two. And three is a little bit different, which I will explain in a later video when we fill orbitals and put the electrons into these orbitals. So <clears throat> there are more subshells other than S and P, which is why number three is a bit different. We have S orbitals, P orbitals, D orbitals, and F orbitals. At A level, you will discuss S and P in detail. D, you will touch a little bit, and that's just for filling electrons up in the transition metal series, but you won't actually discuss the shapes or anything like that, as they're a bit weird and there's actually five orbitals per subshell where P has three and S has one. And F, you won't actually discuss until later years of university, so you do, don't have to worry about that at A level. Now that, that sums up the electrons. So if we look at the area on the periodic table that this correlates to, so this red box here, they have um, S, that's an S subshell, subshell. This green box here, they all have P subshells. This blue box here have D subshells, and for those who are interested, the lanthanide and actinide series. Just these ones separated at the bottom actually have F subshells and F orbitals. And helium here is a little bit of an odd one out because although it's in the group where most of the atoms that have P subshells are, in fact, it only actually has an S subshell. And going back to N equals one having two electrons, this makes sense because you've got hydrogen, which is one electron, increases by one to helium. So that's got two S electrons and no P. And on the next line, you've got S1 for lithium and the second one in the S subshell for beryllium. And then that's full, so we then have to go on to the P subshell. So we've got the boron 1, carbon 2, nitrogen 3, oxygen 4, fluorine 5, and neon 6. So therefore, that's then the P subshell filled up as well. So hence, two electrons here, eight electrons. And then for the third row, uh, you will get eight electrons. However, when you start getting later on, it starts getting more awkward because you have this transition metal series where you have D subshells involved. So now if we look at isotopes, the definition of an isotope is an atom that has the same number of protons and electrons, but with a different number of neutrons. Now, when I said carbon had 12.001 011 atomic mass, and I rounded it to 12. That's because, in fact, it's an average of different isotopes. So you get, you get atoms with different number of neutrons but the same protons and electrons, meaning it has a different atomic mass because the atomic mass is the sum of the protons and neutrons. So here, you get carbon 12. This is a common example. So the atomic mass is 12. Therefore, you have six protons and six neutrons. Whereas you've got carbon-13 over here, we've still got the number six at the top, meaning it has six protons, but it now has seven neutrons. And that's why we get 12.011 as the atomic mass of carbon, because we have these different isotopes. Now how we get that exact number is we take the average, but in nature you have a different percentage of each one. So carbon-12, in nature, all carbon will be 98.90% carbon-12, whereas carbon-13 will have a 1.10% abundance in the universe. 
or as far as we can analyze anyway. So when we take the average of this, we get an average of 12.011. And for those who like maths and would like to confirm this, it's 98.90% of carbon 12 add 1.10% of carbon 13, all divided by 100%, gives you 12.011. And that's how we get the final answer of the atomic mass of an atom. So this will work for anything else. So if there are isotopes of, say, oxygen or nitrogen, the exact same thing will happen, except for you'll just have different numbers involved. So if you ever see a decimal place on the periodic table under the atomic mass, it's because there are isotopes present. And something you will learn in A2 is carbon-13 is very useful in something called NMR, which deduces, helps to deduce the structure of unknown compounds. So I hope you enjoyed this lecture and it was helpful. Uh, please like this video and share and uh, subscribe for more. If you would like to know anything in particular, I can make a video on it. Just leave it in the comments below. Thank you.